While we were moored at Bridgewater, I decided to take a walk down to Worsley to the Delft to have a look at the remarkable underground canal system that revolutionized the coal mining industry. This astonishing creation was more than just a drainage system for the coal mines. It was a feat of innovation and a lifeline for transporting coal to the bustling industries of Manchester. Although we can't explore the fenced-off underground tunnels firsthand, we'll take you on a journey above ground to witness the remarkable remnants and historical landmarks that tell the tale of the Worsley Underground Canal. This site, once referred to as a delved place or dug place, holds a captivating past that shaped the landscape we see today. The Delft served as a bustling quarry for over three centuries. Sandstone, named Worsley Delft Rock, was extensively quarried from this very site, and it played a crucial role in constructing the first Barton Bridge over the Irwell, as well as the iconic Bridgewater Canal and its charming bridges. Notice the curious structure on the island, a contemporary interpretation of the crane that once stood in the Delft. This crane, depicted in Arthur Young's drawing of the Delft in 1771, played a vital role in loading stone onto barges. Because everything is fenced off due to safety, I'm going to take you on an imaginary journey into the tunnel system and describe it for you. At the first entrance, the Duke of Bridgewater's tunnel welcomes us, stretching 1,000 yards. It measures six and a half feet wide and seven and a half feet high, with a water depth reaching three feet, four inches. And as we venture deeper, we discover that the tunnel continues for another 500 yards. Now expanded to a width of 10 feet, it follows a direct line and is set to extend at least another mile and a half. The boats used in this underground canal were 47 feet long and four and a half feet wide, including the gunnels. They were called Starvenger boats. The term Starvenger boat likely refers to boats that appeared skinny or slender due to their narrow and ribbed construction. When loaded, they draw a depth of two feet, six or seven inches and carry an impressive seven to eight tons of cargo. Once outside the tunnel, the loaded boats were drawn by mules or horses to destinations like Manchester and other locations. Typically, four or six boats formed a gang and made their way through the scenic countryside. The underground canal wove an intricate web, intersecting all major coal seams. These steps show the additional canal arms that branched off at right angles, impressive distances. It's crucial to recognize that the mindset and practices of the past were vastly different from modern perspectives on child labor and workers' rights. And as societal awareness grew, so did the understanding of the ethical and moral implications of child labor. It was a hard knock life for these little ones, but they worked with everything they had, a true testament to their grit and determination. These sculptures are meant to be chunks of coal, and uh, they tell a very interesting story. This one says, where possible, pit ponies were used to carry the coal. However, in narrow seams, women and children had the job of carrying the coal while crawling on their hands and knees. Children were chained, belted, harnessed like dogs in a go-kart. Black, saturated with wet, and more than half naked, crawling upon their hands and feet and dragging their heavy loads behind them, they present an appearance indescribably disgusting and unnatural. This was the Children's Employment Commission report. So this is what they might have had on them. Some of the larger children, maybe the teens. I also understand that women would oftentimes wear this belt and then children would go behind the cart and push it while women pulled it. In an attempt to make the mine safer from gas buildup, a rudimentary ventilation method came into play. Young children, often referred to as trappers, 
took on the task of sitting below ground level, operating a series of trap doors strategically placed throughout the mine. These doors facilitated the movement of coal carts while creating air currents that could disperse potentially harmful gas. Interestingly, mine owners hoped that this door system could minimize the impact of an explosion, primarily safeguarding their investment rather than prioritizing the well-being of their workers. Regrettably, this approach proved to be largely ineffective, leading to numerous unfortunate incidents. This one reads, Sarah Gooder, aged eight years. I'm a trapper in the pit. I have to trap without a light and I'm scared. I go at four and sometimes five past three in the morning and come out at five and a half past. I never go to sleep. Sometimes I sing when I've light, but not in the dark. I dare not sing then. I don't like being in the pit. I'm very sleepy when I go sometimes in the morning. This one reads, William Richards, age seven and a half. I've been down about three years. When I first went down, I couldn't keep my eyes open. I don't fall asleep now. I smokes my pipe, smokes half a quarter a week. This little fellow was intelligent and good humored. His cap was furnished with the usual Collier candlestick and his pipe was stuck familiarly in his buttonhole. And this one reads, John Savile, seven years old, Collier's boy. I stand and open and shut the door. I'm generally in the dark and sit me down against the door. I stop 12 hours in the pit. I never see daylight now, except on Sundays. I fell asleep one day and a curve ran over my leg and made it smart. They'd squeeze me against the door if I fell asleep again. Imagine pushing or pulling these tiny wagons or corves filled to the brim with coals weighing a hefty two to three hundred weights. These little wagons ran on rough, bumpy rails. We hope you enjoyed this exploration into the past. And if you enjoyed the video, please share, like, and subscribe. See you soon!